Well, there's a few more people in the waiting room. I'll let them in as well. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that I'm streaming from tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and also pay my respects to all of the First, pe First Nations people anywhere that you are listening to from in the world. Um, I know there's lots of people in Australia, but there are people in other countries as well, too. Um, and so I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and anybody that might be in the audience anywhere in the world and the lands on which we're streaming from or to tonight. Um, welcome to the last Frogs Victoria meeting of the year. Um, we've had a very different year, as I'm sure you, you're well aware this year. And uh, we have been very fortunate to cash in on the Zoom uh, uh, fashion and have some New South Wales speakers. And tonight is no exception. Um, so welcome to Jody, our speaker, who I'll introduce shortly. Also a special, very warm welcome to our patron, Professor Murray Littlejohn, who is in the audience tonight as well. Thanks for joining us, Murray, and thanks for your continued support. Um, so as I said, this is our last Frogs Vic event of the year. We would normally be holding some kind of party in a pub, and that's why we've got this meeting session instead of a webinar tonight, to try and make it as close as possible to what we would normally do. But if you can keep your cameras turned off and keep your microphones turned off, That'd be really great. It makes it a lot easier for, for everyone that's presenting and watching at the same time. When we get to the end, we'll have a question and answer session and then we'll stop recording and you're welcome to, to put your cameras and your microphones on then and we can have a bit of a, a free for all. That's always good fun. Now, before I go any further, I think we better introduce our guest tonight. Dr. Jodie Rowley is the curator of amphibian and reptile conservation biology at the Australian Museum at UNSW, University of New South Wales in Sydney. After a degree in Bachelor of Environmental Science at University of, South Wales, University of New South Wales, Sydney, Jodie completed her PhD at James Cook University in North Queensland, where she used radio telemetry to investigate how differences in behaviour influence the susceptibility of frog species to decline from disease. In 2006, Jodie moved to Cambodia to work as a wildlife biologist for International NGO Conservation International, and began conducting amphibian research in Southeast Asia. She moved to the Australian Museum in 2008, where she continues her focus on Australasian amphibian biodiversity and conservation. I won't say any more because the rest is Jodie's story to tell, so I'll hand over to Jodie now. We'll have a go at sharing, sharing screens because that's always good fun. Thank you, yeah, now this is the, the fun part. Let's see if I can. No, hang on, I've got to make you the host oh, first. Yeah. Yes, I do want to change the host. Okay. I think I can share, um, I guess that, and then hopefully I can make that full screen. Mashing. Yep. Drop the good one. Okay. How's that? Excellent. I'll leave you to it. Thanks, Jodie. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for the welcome. It's it's an honour to be able to present, uh, particularly with Murray Littlejohn in the audience, uh, one of my heroes. So um, that's really exciting. Thank you so much. So tonight I'm going to talk about two very different amphibian adventures that I've been fortunate enough to, I guess, partake on, on these adventures. Um, and they all stem from a love of amphibians. And I didn't grow up knowing that I wanted to be a frog biologist. I actually grew up in the city in Sydney. My parents were kind of uh, city people. I never really saw frogs. Uh, I lived very close to this beautiful frog, the red crowned toadlet. Uh, and yet it wasn't until I was 18 years old that I first really saw and fell in love with frogs. And it was that combined with the fact that frogs were in a lot of trouble um, that I decided to spend my life, like many of you, doing what I could to help conserve amphibians. Uh, and it, it was all trying to get to the same goal, amphibian conservation, but the two adventures that I'm going to talk about are, are very, very different things. And I am so fortunate that I went on that trip out at night, saw frogs and fell in love because 
if it wasn't for that, then I probably wouldn't be talking to you today and I would probably have an incredibly boring job and not do something that, that I'm as, um, I guess, passionate about as, as I'm lucky enough to do at the moment. So the two challenges or the obstacles to amphibian conservation that I've been trying to address, many of you are, and you're tackling things in different ways or addressing different issues um, and doing a lot of amazing on the ground work. But the two kind of main things that have been a theme for me have been the lack of scientific knowledge about amphibians. Um, and then at the same time, also this lack of public awareness and involvement in amphibian conservation. I've been lucky enough to, to primarily work in kind of two parts of the world. Um, and the first part we'll be talking about is, is Southeast Asia. I'm, I'm from Sydney, uh, but after my PhD, as Lynette said, I moved to Cambodia to work for Conservation International. And my goal there was to try and help understand um, how amphibians were doing. And then more recently, I've moved back to focusing more on Australia um, and particularly with the Frog ID project. So that will be the second part of the talk. Less uh, adventure in the traditional style, uh, but definitely an adventure nonetheless. Uh, so the reason I moved to Southeast Asia uh, was because uh, around the time I was finishing my PhD, uh, it, when I was up in James Cook University, it became kind of clear through the global amphibian assessment that the frogs there were in a lot of trouble and that it was kind of a black hole in knowledge. Um, I wonder if, do I have to enter, see any people in? Oh, I've got people, I'm just admitting. Um, okay. Um, so it's what was this big black hole in our knowledge of frogs. Um, and in addition to that, it was undergoing some of the highest deforestation rates on the planet. Uh, and so this is a relatively old paper that was saying between 2000 and 2012, almost one tenth of all the forest um, was lost in Southeast Asia and half was from within protected areas. And essentially other papers showing that protected areas are ineffective in Asia. Uh, and all these photographs, that I've got at the bottom here are showing deforestation occurring within protected areas in Southeast Asia. So we had a frog fauna that was incredibly diverse, absolutely amazing, but yet really poorly known. So we don't even know what areas we need to save and under incredible threat. So I moved over to Cambodia to work with some of my amazing colleagues over there uh, to try and, and do what I could. Um, The additional threats in Southeast Asia, which is some of the things that we don't necessarily have to think about here, is that amphibians are harvested for food, uh, traditional medicine and pets, um, including some of the species that I've, I've co-described with my colleagues, like Helen's flying frog. And this is particularly true for crocodile, newts, um, salamanders, or, or really pretty tree frogs. Our knowledge of amphibians in Southeast Asia in terms of just species diversity is increasing pretty much exponentially. Now this is like a tiny, a tiny bit old, um, but it, it is still going way up. And that is the result of increased expeditions into areas that weren't possible to get into for a while, much more collaboration. And also of course, the incorporation of DNA analysis and bioacoustic analysis into describing frog species. So there's a lot of frogs that look very, very similar to each other that we've been calling the same thing for a long time and now we're just starting to realize that that they are not the same thing and even for the species that we do know the information that we have is is for most species just incredibly poor so i uh, I guess I first realized this when looking at um, IUCN red list assessments, so conservation status assessments, and they would create maps of where the frogs were known from. And there was just all these really unlikely scenarios being proposed in these maps. For example, the first image shows two locations for a frog and, and that's the only places that they're known for. Well, it's likely that these are two species or they're actually distributed much more widely than that. On the second one shows a frog that appears to have some sort of border visa restriction, um, only known from China and seems to be stopping at the border into Myanmar, Laos and, um, and Vietnam. So some really just a, almost complete lack of, of knowledge. 
So the first thing I set out to do was work with an amazing team of people to conduct expeditions in remote forested areas under immediate threat. And unfortunately, under immediate threat actually is pretty much any forest that is in that region. We work in the wet season, which is the time where all of the other biologists, of course, remove themselves from the forest and we head in um, leeches and all to look for frogs and in this part of the talk is where I also include a lot of gratuitous photos of just really cool amphibians to show you. The kinds of things we did we would look at google earth we would find a really amazing patch of forest and then we would go there and these are the gps waypoints that show our, our expedition um, over time up to the top of the mountain in search of frogs and this is what it would look like from the bottom this is where we got what dumped on the back of motorbikes and then we would just climb up into the mountains in the background and try and find what amphibians were there Sometimes the getting there was, was pretty difficult, not just up the mountain. So this was one of the main roads um, about a fair while ago, now more than 10 years ago uh, in Cambodia. And that truck had been there uh, for a couple of days. We managed to get a minibus through that though, which was quite remarkable. Other times, because it is the monsoon season, the rivers are high enough for us to be able to, to get up them. And we camp usually sleeping in hammocks. Um, and and going out in search of frogs at night. And there are my clothes hanging on that um, near the hammock structure. And of course they will never get dry because the forests are just very, very wet. And there's the leeches. So there is a lot of leeches. And what did we find? Uh, this is actually a little bit old now, but we've discovered um, a whole number of species. The red dots are places where we did surveys uh, together over around 10 years, expeditions in search of frogs. And some of the frogs that we were lucky enough to discover are illustrated around the edge. And I'm gonna actually give a little bit more information on some of these, show some photographs and also um, some other frogs just completely gratuitously to show you how amazing they are. This is Quang's tree frog. It's a frog that's only about two centimetres in body length. It uh, has green blood and turquoise bones. And there was recently a paper about the um, green blood in frogs. Um, and it provides some fantastic camouflage, apparently, uh, against leaves, which is where they tend to hang out. Um, and in addition to that, this species has what is known as a hyperextended vocal repertoire. Um, and so it means it doesn't do a stereotypical call like normal frogs. Um, it doesn't repeat the same thing. It makes a call that is uh, clicks and whistles and chirps and it sounds a lot like a bird. So it's also being called uh, the, the frog that sings like a bird. It also lays its eggs on the tips of leaves where they develop into tadpoles and then drop into the muddy pools below. So it's a pretty, pretty amazing frog. And shortly after discovering that frog, we also discovered that its two closest relatives, which are also uh, turquoise boned and, and green blooded, um, that they also had hyperextended vocal repertoires as well. So whatever these frogs are saying, they're saying more than your average frog. Um, and if you Google these guys, you'll be able to hear their call as well. So I'm pretty sure if you just Google the, the frog that sings like a bird, but it's called Quang's tree frog, then, then you'll be able to hear their amazing calls. Another amazing tree frog in the family Racophoridae was discovered by my colleagues and I on the top of the highest mountain in central Vietnam. And you just can't get how steep it actually is, but um, Jung and Vinh are on a, like a very steep mountain. There's actually no water because it would just run straight off. So there's no streams, there's no ponds. The only water that is on the tops of these mountains is actually in water filled tree holes, like you can see here on the right. And those eggs are actually the eggs of this tree frog. And then they develop and fall into the little pool below. And this is what that adult frog looks like at night. At night, uh, they are yellow and pink, which is pretty spectacular. Um, and in the, in the day, they go a little bit more dull colored and males in breeding condition, it seems, have these hard keratinized spikes all over their back. Uh, we called this the thorny tree frog. Grisixillus lumerius in honor of the thorns. And they are a pretty amazing frog that's quite evolutionary distinct. A fantastic frog. 
Another frog in, in the Racophorid family is the vampire flying frog from the, the mountains of, of the Delat Plateau in southern Vietnam. Uh, this frog is named because its tadpoles, instead of having the normal little raspy mouth parts, actually have two black fangs sticking out of their mouths. Um, and it's unfortunately, I can't tell you that they use them to, to suck blood. Um, they actually have, have these fangs because they also live in these tiny tree holes without much food. And the mother comes back and lays unfertilized eggs for them to eat. And they use their big mouths and their spikes to suck the eggs down whole. And you can actually see in this little metamorph that's been turned upside down, you can see the whole white eggs inside its belly, which is pretty amazing. One of my favorite frogs um, that I was lucky enough to, to describe, uh, scientifically describe with my colleagues was Helen's flying frog. So this, you can really tell why these guys are called flying frogs. They have enormous hands and feet and they're extremely webbed and they use these to glide down from the canopy. And if you guys have not been in Southeast Asia in the beginning of the monsoon season in a flooded forest or somewhere where there's temporary ponds around, you definitely need to add it to your bucket list. It's absolutely amazing to stand in a pond and have frogs just dropping out of the canopy and splashing into the pond around you. Um, and this frog I named after my mother, Helen. Um, and, and so it's a, a very special frog um, to me as, as well as unfortunately an endangered species as its habitat is disappearing in southern Vietnam. Uh, another frog, a Theloderma, also a, a racophorid, um, an Asian tree frog. This, this was called, um, we named the cloaked moss frog because it actually would be quite, um, I guess, not as, as distinctively patterned at night, but in the day it would kind of uncloak and it would be much more beautiful, kind of chocolatey dark brown along the side and quite pale with like a, a spot and some patterns during the day. Uh, a frog, a very different kind of frog in the family Megafriidae, uh, the white-eyed spadefoot frog, which was pretty remarkable. It lived in the same forest as the red-eyed spadefoot frog, um, which had these amazing red tops of the colours of the eye. But these guys have the half white, half, um, half black, and they're actually very, very similar in a lot of ways to Mixithes as well, in the way they behave, in the way that their call sounds. It is quite remarkable the convergence that you also see between Australian uh, and, and Asian frogs. And this is now completely gratuitous. I did not describe this frog, um, but this was one of my favourite frogs that I did not see for many, many years in, in Vietnam in my work there, even though it does occur. But because they live most of the time up in the trees, when I first saw these guys, I went absolutely mental. Um, and this is the Vietnam mossy frog. They are popular in the pet trade, um, unfortunately for them, although they are quite easy to breed in captivity, so hopefully are not being taken from the wild. Their biggest threat still is probably habitat loss, but they're an absolutely amazing Amazing frog and they take their camouflage pretty seriously uh, so you can barely even see that this pair of mossy frogs have eyeballs um, they're they're very 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 cool frogs uh, of course its relative is the bird poo frog uh, and this is a frog that is thought to mimic bird poo in coloration that's Theloderma asperum group but most of the time while I've been working in Southeast Asia, I've actually been working on tiny little frogs that no one else really cared about. Um, frogs that sound so much like insects, even though I focus on these a lot of the time. Sometimes I'm crawling around on my hands and knees and I'm like, really like, I actually now I don't know if I am looking for an insect or a frog. I can't, I can't tell. Um, and they're around about just under two centimetres to some of the biggest ones, maybe five centimetres and they live in the leaf litter. And Prior to, to my colleagues and I working on them, there was only a couple of species known. And, and now there are many, many species in that group. Um, one of the most interesting being Botsford leaf flitter frog, which is only known from the highest mountain in Vietnam, Mount Fancy Pan. Uh, and it's, it's kind of miserable for humans up there. It, it goes, it's up to 3,200 metres and the main field site's about 2,800 metres. It's always misty, it's very steep, it's very wet, but this little frog lives on the top of it. And it's 
I guess uh, a really good example of why we do the work that, that we do uh, at the Australian Museum and in my team of colleagues um, from, from Southeast Asia is that we work to discover what species are there, but then we also work to assess its conservation status. So part of our job is then taking it to the next level, discovering the species like the vampire flying frog, and then actually um, getting everything we know about it together, putting it online as part of the IUCN Red List assessments. Um, and then that information is public and can also be used to prioritize uh, conservation efforts in the area. So from the work that my colleagues and I have been doing, um, we didn't really have a great understanding when I first started. So about the time that I was finishing my PhD, this is what the global amphibian assessment produced in terms of the diversity of frogs in mainland Southeast Asia. The um, blue areas that are less diverse and the, the red warmer colors that are more diverse. Um, and, th and that was what the situation looked like. But because of the work of my colleagues and I, and now this is a few years old, so we're working on the next update. Um, what it's allowed us to do is get a much better understanding of where the most important places are for amphibians. Uh, for example, previously it wasn't as clear that the Honglian Range in northern Vietnam was, was a super um, high species diversity area for, for amphibians. Uh, the, the Nayan um, province, a lot of the forests there also coming up is incredibly important. And the Budip Nuba and, and the associated Dalat Plateau as well um, is now we're realizing is an incredibly important area, not just for how many species of amphibians there are, but also a high endemism. So species found only there and nowhere else. And that's allowed us to actually, for the first time, start to get a really good understanding of what species need actual conservation action now. So we found uh, Botsford's leaf litter frog in 2012 for the first time. We described it about a year later, so it got a scientific name. Um, and then in 2015, it was formally assessed as critically endangered. It's only known from the top of, of this highest mountain. And now we know just a little bit um, outside that and its, its habitat is a tourist site. So uh, suffering a lot from using the gravel that they breed in for, for building um, and also just a lot of tourism. And, and so we are working a lot now, not only still on describing the new species, uh, but also trying to prioritise. And we've just finished the, the next um, conservation assessment update for mainland Southeast Asia, and, um, which will really help us prioritise conservation efforts because unfortunately we can't save it all. So while I am still definitely working in Southeast Asia, although right now I cannot actually physically be in Southeast Asia, I was planning on being back there um, this year, um, I, I am now and have been working a lot more back in Australia, which has been uh, really amazing. Uh, and I, I guess I don't need to tell anyone here that Australia's frogs are also in, you know, a fair bit of trouble. Um, we haven't got a great track record. We've already lost some species, uh, a whole bunch are on the edge of extinction. Um, and again, this is a, a couple of years old, but we still don't know how many species we have in Australia, which is surprising. Um, you know, there's still species, uh, I guess it was about a month ago now, um, there was another species of Australian frog described, uh, Latoria Watsonai, and there are many more that are actually in, in progress. So we're still getting a handle on how many species of frog we even have in Australia. Um, and of, of course, this is the, the only frog that I've co-authored in Australia at the moment. Um, and of course, that would be one of my favourites. But the fact that there's like a beautiful tree frog um, that's essentially a rainbow coloured frog that was only relatively recently described um, is, is still kind of amazing to me. And for the frogs that we do know, we actually don't know that much about them still. So this is a map of Australia, obviously, showing all of the records of frogs on the Atlas of Living Australia, um, the sort of biodiversity aggregate. Um, and this was taken probably almost a year ago now, uh, but it hasn't changed too much. Um, and so this is all of the frogs that have been collected by museums, recorded um, in any way um, in the last uh, roughly um, a couple of hundred years. So um, this is all the records we have when it comes to conservation planning and you know trying to figure out what, what land use should be where. This is basically what we have to go on. Um, and even when you start to zoom in, you start to realize that there are hundreds of kilometers 
even in New South Wales, you know, not that far from Sydney, and the same is true in Victoria, where there are no records of frogs. And frogs are really tricky animals, as you all know. And um, if you need to go out and do an assessment, particularly in these arid areas, if it's not raining, then good, good luck. Um, and so we really need to have these records of frogs on the map. And frogs have one very, very cool thing, which makes some makes uh, it possible to be able to know when they are there um, a lot of the time. And that is that frogs call. And there are some species, and in this case, I'm particularly on the right, you can see uh, I've got uh, a couple of the green stream frogs, Latoria barringtonensis and Latoria um, philocroa, and they have really, really similar in appearance. And the easiest way to tell these guys apart is by their call. And this brings frog ID in. So frog ID arose due to a conversation between myself and the director of the Australian Museum, uh, Kim McKay, and where I was telling her that every species of frog has a you know, different call um, and, and that, that we really, really need information on Australia's frogs to help inform conservation. Uh, and she said, well, we need a, a frog Shazam. Um, and then she kind of made it happen, which is really amazing. And so we worked for a long time, got the support of a lot of people, and we developed a Frog ID, which is a field guide. Um, and it's up to date. We've got Latoria Watson I in there. Um, it's free, so you can download it. And if, if you guys have better calls or, or better photographs, please, and you would uh, be happy to have them using Frog ID, please, please let us know. Uh, and it's got lots of information. But primarily, it's a tool for people to help us understand where our frogs are and how they are doing simply by pressing record with this amazing bit of technology that most of us have in our pockets. And Murray, it's, it's not as good quality recordings for the most part as it is if you use professional recording equipment, but it is not bad. Um, so obviously not every recording uh, are fantastic. Sometimes people are very far away from the frogs and then you can just faintly hear them. But we do get some pretty amazing recordings just through your smartphone. You can attach a microphone if you wanted, but just from your smartphone, you get pretty decent recordings for the most part. So this is what we see on the back end with every recording that is submitted through the Frog ID app. You see something like this. So this is a recording um, that I have taken in a, a national park, I think, or somewhere pretty remote. I had no phone reception because you don't need phone reception and no one had ever recorded a frog in that part of, in that whole stream ever before. So there were no records on the Atlas of Living Australia or anywhere else, no one had done a frog survey. And so I went down there, I managed to record the call of the red-backed toadlet, Cedophony coriacea. And it's got the GPS location. It's got accuracy, which is really, really important. Um, very occasionally phones lose their mind and they don't know where they are, but that will be reflected in the accuracy. So the accuracy of this recording without mobile reception was within six meters. Uh, you can see a little waveform of the call and you can play it as well. Um, and as a, a validator, and, and that is me, uh, an image of me, um, I sit with earphones on, I listen to the recording and then pick the frog. And then we also write a note to the person usually. Sometimes people ask questions, we say things back. Um, but essentially you get all this information just by pressing record for 20 to 60 seconds. Frog ID has been going for just over three years now. Um, and uh, I mean, to me, the, the results are remarkable. So when we started Frog ID, there were about uh, 500,000 records of frogs on the Atlas of Living Australia from Australia. Uh, many of them, the geo precision wasn't great. Some weren't identified to anything but frog or, or maybe Latoria. Um, you know, others, the, it was sort of like they said they were in, in Northern Territory or sort of Sydney, but you know, it wasn't a, a very accurate recording. And, and that's what we had at the time. But so far for Frog ID, we've had 183,000 submissions from across Australia and almost 300,000 validated records. 
Uh, you can see it does look a little bit like a population map of Australia, um, and, and that is because it's a citizen science project, so you get definitely more recordings where people are. And uh, Frog ID has been going nuts uh, this year, um, particularly since the kind of drought, not necessarily broke, but certainly that there was rain. Last year was a really tough year for, for, for everyone and um, frogs were no exception. So um, in terms of the number of submissions, we just keep getting higher and higher. And in Frog ID week, which was 10 days, we received over 10,000 submissions resulting in more than 20,000 records of frogs in 10 days, um, which is, is kind of amazing. I'm very lucky to be part of this project, but it's thanks to absolutely everybody out there that records frogs. Now, this is the specifically put here to shame Victorians um, into recording more frogs. Uh, so New South Wales is kicking your butt um, and the vast majority of submissions are from New South Wales. Um, Queensland and Victoria, neck and neck. Um, the NT really punches above its weight though. Um, it, you know, it gets half a year basically without frogs and it doesn't have the greatest population compared to other states, but we get a lot of amazing recordings from the NT. We are at 199 species of frog and you can see it definitely has tapered off but there are still quite a lot of frogs that we have not yet received a recording of where we're getting there uh, but uh, not all frogs are recorded equally obviously so um, I have heard a lot of Crinia signifera recordings in my life. Uh, they are the most commonly recorded frog by far, which is quite interesting because that was my dog shaking. Um, it's quite interesting because we actually, there are quite few records of and specimens of these guys because they're really, really hard to see. I've probably only seen 30 Crinia in my life, um, but I've certainly heard a lot more. And in Victoria, Crinia is also hands down winner. It's also good at getting some rare and threatened species when local communities or community groups or partnerships with, with government sort of get involved. So prior to Frog ID, there were actually really few records of Sloan's froglet. And now there are, uh, thanks to Frog ID and all the people out there and the Sloan's champions in particular, we've got more than 1500 records of Sloan's froglet. Uh, Coranda tree frogs now, the team that are monitoring these guys up in Coranda, uh, they're actually recording them quite often. So there's 93 records, including from a stream where they had never previously been recorded, which is really, really fantastic. And there are a bunch of not only just local groups, um, but also researchers using a frog ID, um, using it in their research, getting communities to help monitor their own frogs um, and then have a look at the data as well, which is really, really excellent. Some of the things we've learnt uh, from Frog ID so far um, are some cases of some disappearing frogs. So in Sydney, there'd been kind of anecdotal evidence for a long time, people saying there used to be green tree frogs. Definitely there are tons of records at the Australian Museum. Um, and you know, they were right in the middle of Sydney, um, Manly, Cronulla, Ranwick, there was green tree frogs all over the place back in the day, um, but they certainly have disappeared from Sydney. So uh, we get very, very few records of green tree frogs in Sydney and most of them on the outskirts. So it's been probably a very gradual decline where they're just not breeding and, and now they, they are, are, are disappeared from most of Sydney. And we're also getting an understanding of the cane toad um, and its distribution and, it, and its spread. Um, we are receiving records of cane toads from Western Australia, from that leading front, and also from New South Wales. And we do monthly exports of frog ID records of cane toads uh, to New South Wales DPI and, um, and, and let them know if there are any cane toads in the kind of biosecurity zone outside of where they are known. Uh, and Frog ID has also been used to detect cane toads in, in places outside their known range, which is really important. Uh, and a particular note for Victoria, um, we certainly are finding that there are frogs that appear to have hitchhiked, maybe in produce, maybe in nursery plants outside of the native range. And obviously it was known that um, 
the, the eastern dwarf tree frog, Latoria phallix, has populations in, in Melbourne and in, in northern Victoria, but we're certainly seeing, and this was from uh, a couple of years ago, we're seeing that they are actually spreading um, and we're hoping to collaborate with, with colleagues at Albury in particular to try and figure out what's going on with them. But they, they and other frogs have been detected well outside their native range via frog ID. So frog ID is, thanks to everybody out there, doing what we were hoping it would. It's helping fill knowledge gaps on distributions, um, on breeding seasons, uh, breeding habitats, patterns of diversity. Uh, and for example, uh, the striped rocket frog um, was, you know, we, we made maps based upon the Atlas of Living Australia. We, we got a recording in the first year from uh, a man called Robert, who was out, uh, who's a boar runner in the Northern Territory, just recorded frogs near his, his place where he was sleeping. And it was over a hundred kilometer sort of range extension for the striped rocket frog, Latoria Nasuda, just from right near his beer fridge, which was, which was pretty amazing. So it's, it's pretty simple actions of people doesn't take a lot of effort on their behalf and they're able to make really significant uh, improvements and we're updating the maps and the breeding seasons and everything in frog id all the time as we get more information to help us understand where our frogs are and when they breed too frog id is also really useful at looking at impacts of change uh, so for example um, Brittany Mitchell, uh, part of my team, she analysed a lot of red tree frog, Latoria rubella calls from across Australia uh, to try and understand if the frogs were being affected by urbanisation or modification, if they were changing their calls. And we're looking a lot at urbanisation and the impacts of frogs, both in terms of the audio recordings that we receive, but also just the data of frogs and where they are. Uh, because you kind of have these two things with frog ID. You just have the, the biodiversity records, but you also have this associated uh, attached audio recordings. And something that we definitely didn't expect uh, to, to ha have the data to help with um, was, was due to the fires um, over the summer. So we had this amazing data set, some of the probably the best data about biodiversity in, in Australia immediately pre-fire and then also post-fire when we, you know, our scientists couldn't really get out there and, and look to see what was happening. There were people across the fire zone, across an enormous extent that were recording frogs. Um, and certainly we've been getting a lot of recordings and trying to promote uh, people to safely use the Frog ID app to record frogs, hopefully recovering. And certainly the first paper that we produced about the impact of fires on frogs was good news and it did show that frogs seem to be calling obviously not all species but there were quite a number of frogs calling relatively short term after the fire and of course there is a lot of people out there now doing the other work that's 100 percent needed which is ground truthing and doing scientific surveys and surveying the frogs that are not likely to be detected by a citizen science we're also looking at using frog ID records for taxonomy and species discovery. Um, we're hoping, and, and there's some, some hints of sort of rediscovering missing species or populations. Um, and we're also looking at just more sort of ecology and evolution questions. For example, which frog species called during the day? And it's just, it's got this massive data set all of a sudden. And so far we've managed to produce quite a few publications as well. So we've been really, really pushing to try and make sure that this data that people are standing out in the rain for is actually being used to produce papers. And of course, they, it's released annually into the Atlas of Living Australia um, as well. But I think the greatest contribution of Frog ID is actually been not, not the science, it hurts me a little bit to say that, um, not this amazing information that we're getting on Australia's frogs, but it's actually all of the people out there recording frogs and some of the feedback that we've received from people as well as to, to how it's kind of made them realise that frogs are there. You know, if I hadn't come across frogs when I was 18, which was pretty late in life, I, I just wouldn't have become a frog biologist. I just didn't know they were there. And there's a lot of people that walk past frogs, jog past frogs, hear frogs and don't even think, is that a frog? Or, or even, you know, it's, it's not part of people's pictures. We're so disconnected for the most part from the environment around us. And if we don't know and, and care about what's around us, then our biodiversity and our frogs don't have any hope. We have received some amazing feedback from people. And, and these are some quotes from a little while ago that we received. I'm just gonna read them real quickly. 
So three months ago, I knew nothing about frogs and now it's all I see and hear. As a farmer, it feels, I feel good. Yes, I feel it is good to know what type of frogs are about and how they're going in the environment. The health of my waterways through the property is important. This project keeps me in touch with which species are around and can be telling as to what is happening to my water health. Now I need to move my face from over this one. Within a very short space of time, our frog knowledge and awareness has expanded. And recently, very late one evening after being on the road for 11 hours, we passed through a shower of rain. We didn't think twice at fleeing the car off the highway to listen to frogs. Our life has become far richer. You did that. And it makes us feel like we really can make a difference at a local level. So all this has made me realize, you know, we, we can't do this alone. Us passionate frog crazy people, we can't do this alone. We need everybody to join the mission to save our amazing frogs. And people are joining the mission. They care. They're standing out there recording Sloan's froglets in the middle of winter, night after night. And people are doing eight hour shifts and then driving four hours to get a frog that, that is, is new to them and put it on the map. Uh, people are willing to stand with us and fight for our frogs. And so I think this project from AD um, has been absolutely amazing, um, privilege for me to be involved in and made me hopeful, made me realise that um, people are, are standing with us in our fight for frogs. And that's the only way that we'll be able to make sure that our frogs are croaking and ribbiting into the future as if we have Australia behind us. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Jody. What an incredible way for us to finish up the year of Frogs Victoria. Thank you so much. What a great honour to have you talking with us tonight. Um, 